Welcome to FII ThinkPod. My name is Francisco. And I'm Aziz. And at ThinkPod, we speak about the smartest ideas and the biggest challenges facing the world right now. We speak about where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Today's guest on ThinkPod is Stanford professor E3, a leader in the field of nanotechnology. We discuss the future of energy storage, the issues of mining lithium and cobalt, and how he combines his cutting edge research with entrepreneurship to commercialize technology for real world use. I'd like to start with a quick question. What is nanoscience? Nanotechnology is trying to use uh, the size of uh, an object or we call materials to define the technological areas. It's really not a technology. It's when you get to that size, it is a lot of interesting things happening. The physical property, chemical property changes. So you can utilize those change for making useful things more powerful, new functions coming in, whether it's related to energy, it's related to electronics, or it's related to healthcare, it has a new applications. So that's a shortest answer of uh, what's nanotechnology. Beyond nanotechnology, you believe you have a lot of other areas that you're doing research in. Which, which areas are the ones that you're most passionate about, and which ones would you like to tell us more about? I combine nanotechnology to solve uh, energy and environmental problems, uh, basically for sustainability. That's what I'm most passionate about. How do we make batteries more sustainable? In the energy space, the batteries are very important areas. They can address the problem for electrical transportation, for storing more solar and wind electricity, integrating into the electrical grid. The battery certainly is now facing number of, uh, you know, I would say challenges as well as opportunities. One is how do you increase the energy you store inside the batteries for a given weight, given size. If you can have the energy, doubling the energy you store, you can have your electrical car running for roughly doubling the uh, distance or maybe more. The battery is also facing the circular economy challenges right there. We need to produce so many batteries. Do we have enough resources for doing so? Do we have the, the right uh, technology, low cost environmental footprint, uh, not so big, to recycle the batteries or reuse or recycle? So these are all the challenges we are facing. So Dr. Yi, one of the biggest challenges that we see is perhaps in energy storage, right? Challenges perhaps with storing solar energy and nuclear energy with the hazards that it poses. Where do you see the future of energy storage going to? Speaking of energy storage problem, it's one of the most important, exciting problems we will need to address. Solar cell does not provide electricity all the time, only during the day it's generating what about the night. So is the wind electricity, right? This is, are the uh, intermittent sources. So that's why energy storage is so important. You know, we have uh, old traditional technology already. It's pumping water uphill, and then when you use it, you know, you let it flow down. Uh, and this is very low cost, lasts for 50 years, 100 years, uh, very reliable. It just it cannot be done in all the locations. And the batteries offer an option for energy storage. However, the cost is still high. And the cycle life, how many cycles charging, discharging, and the calendar life, how many years can you use it? These are still very limited. So we will need technology breakthrough in these areas. And particularly considering the storing electricity, this will go across from minutes to stabilize the grid, to hours, to day, to weeks, to months, to seasonal. And this requires the cost uh, requirements very different. And the technology could be different for this different time scale of storage. We really need technology breakthrough. One technology I worked on recently, uh, is on a nickel hydrogen gas batteries can store electricity very low cost, also very very safe as well, and also it can be operated in a very wide range of temperature, very cold can go down to minus forty, very high plus sixty degrees Celsius. I mean this keeps coming. I think uh, the potential is, is there, but we still don't have uh, all the solutions yet. Calling for the uh, technology innovation. For the case of nuclear, right, nuclear output stable power, but certainly, you know, people's uh, power consumption 
uh, change day and night. So nuclear is good to provide a really good baseline of the power. But if you have a lot of nuclear, you also need to think about how to store nuclear power as well. You've worked in pioneering lithium batteries. How do we work with materials like lithium in an ethical way? So lithium batteries, the ethical issue is, has been debated, right? You talk about it, you know, in the last in a number of years. Well, first of all, lithium battery use lithium, cobalt. You need to mine this nickel, this element. And the mining issue, right, in the past disclosed in Africa and Republic of uh, Congo. Congo and having this ethical issue using, you know, kids for, for mining. Oh, we really need to address those, you know, these, uh, these is, uh, important issues. Of course, there's also geopolitical issue right there, in addition to ethical issue. And then that how the whole, whole supply chain, global supply chain will be uh, flowing in a healthy way. That needs to be considered. Oftentimes, like lithium, uh, the mining of some uh, battery-related uh, elements they are done in the uh, countries, uh, you know, not as a uh, develop, and uh, there could be ethical issue keep showing up. I, the, all the people just need to pay attention to not supporting the uh, this ethical issues. So I re really measure solving these issues completely. Do you think that there will be a greater awareness of say artisanal mining, say in DRC in Congo? Uh, that may affect consumers adopting batteries in, say, EVs and other technology applications? I think this will influence people's decision. If there's issue on the S-Cost side, and many companies would not want to buy that uh, the mine, the, uh, the product from the places having those issues, then people will open up a new location to mine it. I mean, for example, cobalt. Let me use cobalt as an example. There's uh, really two major reasons to move away from cobalt and the lithium ion batteries. One is because the cost is high. We don't have enough cobalt. The second one is uh, the ethical issue showing up. It's particularly cobalt is the notorious one. Uh, this is really driving people to go to high nickel content. And at the same time, this will solve the issue of ethical as well as the cost. You worked with the former Secretary of Energy under the Obama administration on forming policies on energy. Where do you see the intersection of policy making and research? Yes, I did work closely with the Professor Steve Chu uh, after he stepped down from Secretary of Energy position with Obama. He came back to Stanford as a professor. Well, he has a lot of great ideas, both on technology and policy. I interacted with him closely, actually influenced by him quite a bit on the policy thinking. Policy is very, very important. And uh, if you look at clean energy transition, there are three very important things, technology, policy, finance. These three things need to all work out. Of course, finance and policy is also closely coupled together. For example, to adopt the, uh, some of the clean technologies, the price initially, the cost is high, and it will not be competitive economically without considering the carbon's uh, footprint. Uh, if the carbon price is a factor in, this technology could be adopted in a reasonable rate. So, I mean, that's part of the policy I, I see can play an important role is uh, whether it's using uh, regulation, using uh, tax, right? Somehow put a price on carbon will be important to get people, to get companies to adopt the clean energy technologies. So policies, uh, power is very, very big. Recently, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia made a commitment by 2060 to reach uh, net zero carbon emissions. How aggressive should these you know, carbon cost or carbon tax measures should be to reach those commitments? Saudi, the kingdom, um, to commit 2060, 2060. yeah. There's a, a number of companies like China is 2060 also. There's a number of companies committed 2050. We have 30 years, 40 years to get there. You say, well, is it long? No, it's not long enough. I know. Yeah, I know. I, well, it's really not long. I look at my age, I say, oh my God, I'm like 45 right now. But the 45 years just like blinking an eye. So, yeah. so <laughs> I mean, it's just that long. You need to get to net zero. That's a, a very, very challenging. We need to go very aggressive, of course. However, I also want to remind everybody, we need to go in a way step by step 
to ensure we have energy security, make sure people have access to the energy, to the power. Otherwise, we could see people can lose electricity for a few days. The blackout just happens so often. Industry production might not go as normal. Right? This is all you know, under discussion, under careful study, how aggressive we should do What's the reasonable carbon price we should set up? I don't have a clear answer for you. Uh, we really need experts to work together, individual nation as well as collaboration between nations. You know, it's really global issue, right? They have to figure this out. You just mentioned that you're 45 years young. Uh, not only have you become a world-renowned Thank uh, you. researcher <laughs> and scientist in that time, but you're also an entrepreneur. Can you talk to us about that journey that you took from a scientist to an entrepreneur and some of the projects that you're working on right now? You know, I come in to uh, become a professor 16 years ago to Stanford University. Didn't think that much about entrepreneurship at the time. I was only right at the beginning, you know, focused on research. But I do see I want to do three things really well. I just didn't know what would be the uh, timing to start entrepreneurship. One is cutting edge research. I really want to do it well. I mean, our previous discussion on all this technology right, is the area I work on. The second thing is commercializing this technology into the real world so it can have a real impact, uh, have real impact to people's life. The third thing is education. And uh, these are the three things I want to do very well. I started my first company to do entrepreneurship. It, it was really due to back in 2007, you know, 14 years ago now, I have this technology of high energy density lithium ion batteries based on silicon as the anode to store 10 times more lithium than the traditional, the existing graphite anode. That's so exciting, using nanotechnology to enable silicon to store lithium without mechanical breaking issue because there's so many lithium get stored right there. So we solved this major problem and I got contacted by uh, Silicon Valley uh, Venture Capitals. You know, Stanford is sitting in the heart of Silicon Valley. We were blamed for starting Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley is really a Stanford spin out right there. At uh, close to Stanford, the Sun Hill, uh, Sun Hill Road has several hundred venture capital firms. Many of them got in touch with me, and, and that really motivated me. Maybe that was the time I should think about starting our company, commercializing this technology for the uh, real world use. So uh, fast forward, now it's been 14 years. We did have commercial product in the market, highest energy density batteries in the world. Uh, the company's name is Amprius. So after that, it just keeps coming. You know, this more technology company has started. Uh, this air filtration company, facial mask. We produce our own facial mask. I also have uh, this nickel hydrogen gas batteries I just mentioned earlier to store solar electricity. I also have uh, cooling clothing and warming clothing company, Life Labs. This just keeps going. By now, I have uh, five startup companies uh, pushing this technology forward. I'm very excited about they are making uh, progress you know, towards the real world. So you talked about education. And one of the areas we want to talk to you about is what issues or opportunities do you see in education today? So education is something uh, I'm very passionate about. In education, certainly traditionally, we say, well, let's first of all get all the kids to school. Make sure they go to school as the first step, right? That's a very important step. And then in school, usually it's classroom teaching, right? That's, of course, important. We are all educated this way. However, when you go further, you say education actually involving, I believe, I mean, for the context of uh, uh, sustainability, clean energy, we need the kids to understand the real world problems earlier and be part of that participation of a solution finding. That will be very important part of education. In addition to classroom teaching, right, if we can expose the uh, kids early on to participate in the hands-on experience of problem solving, I believe that's very important. Then if I would say structure this in a way, 
what, what does elementary school can do? What do the high schools can do? What's, what do college can do? And then what about PhD, uh, you know, graduate student, PhD student? Of course, they are different, but there's some common you know, theme right there is uh, get to the real problem, uh, expose them, and excite them so they can see where the impact uh, are. I interacted with many students, particularly you know, when they're in high school, doing summer interns with me. That's one way I can influence high school students is I actually recruit high school students into my lab during summer at Stanford University and doing, and doing research. Some of them, of course, high GPA, but they don't have that type of excitement yet about hey, you know, solving real world problems. What is it like? They have no idea, but they can work with me for a summer with my PhD student coming out, working on the batteries, technology, water filtration, right, air cleanup. And after that summer, they just become so excited, completely fired up, and they can go back to their school. Actually, they are willing to study even harder to solve those problems. I see that this, this type of education of classroom teaching and the real world hands-on come hand in hand, so important. The Institute recently published an impact report with the title of Education and Poverty. How do you think education can play as a role of enabler to become more inclusive and more accessible to help more impoverished people you know, embed their lifestyles? This is a very, very important question we need to address. To be inclusive, uh, really enable you know, low-income family, disadvantaged community, to have access to education uh, resources. I mean, this will be a continuous uh, effort, I think, for decades, right, for us to solve. And uh, I look at my own examples. Uh, I, when I offer high school internship, I offer also to those I see a disadvantage families and get them to come in. Once you let this opportunity open to these kids, you, you can see that they, they they just transform so fast. I was so happy to see it. I really encourage the, the whole society, right? Open this up to be inclusive and uh, really take a proactive approach and in getting into the community of uh, disadvantages and uh, you know, encourage them and offer to them the opportunities they could explore. I mean, that would be the way I, I, I would say. There's probably a, a number of other ways we need to do more. I mean, this is the way from my angle I can see I can offer. I, I, I really love to learn, you know, uh, and strongly support uh, we will do more. We have one last question for you. You have accomplished so much at such a young age and you're doing so much to enable society to follow your footsteps perhaps. What type of personal legacy do you wish to leave behind for future generations? Oh, this made me feel very old to answer these <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thinking about legacy already. <laughs> Maybe I should uh, come back to the, uh, uh, the early time I said, there are three things I really want to do well. Cutting edge research, generating the best technologies, and translate that into the society. Second thing, educating students. I mean, these are the three things uh, uh, right now. I mean, adding myself to the four things I, I never thought about I will be doing. I recently uh, stepped up as the uh, uh, director of Preco Institute for Energy. It's uh, Preco is a cross-cutting uh, university, energy institute, and coordinate all the energy activity. It's a service job, serving my colleagues, serving the whole Stanford community serving you know, broadly alumni, serving the, the world, basically coming up the energy strategies for uh, solving, you know, for the clean energy transition. Hopefully this will help the whole community and even broader to uh, transform into clean, affordable, sustainable and secure energy. Thank you so much, Professor Yi. We appreciate having you on the ThinkPod and we welcome you again, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. We would love you to let others know about this podcast. So please rate us, leave us a comment, and share with someone who might enjoy it too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our next episode.